Okay, let's get started. Uh, there's a lot to cover today. So, um, all right, so I thought I'd try to um, record my iPad screen. That's why I'm wearing these goofy headphones. Um, maybe upload them by the end of the week or something. So I save some time if I sort of batch the Tuesday and Thursday lecture, so. Okay, so. Hopefully, we're all in the right place, and hopefully, this is randomized algorithms. Uh, please let me know. If not, and I will leave. Um, okay, let's get the boring stuff out of the way first. Okay, so uh, the course website uh, is fundamentalalgorithms.com slash randomized. It's basically one big PDF that will have everything in it, um, including lecture notes, homework, everything, schedule, uh, go check it out later. Um, in particular, though, there's a syllabus um, that I would like you guys to read over, at least the parts that are like particular to the class and the university policy stuff that's the same for everyone. That's kind of boring. But let me maybe mention uh, uh, just some, some, maybe some quick highlights or things to keep an eye out for. So this is... Uh, you know, a moderately serious course, because I believe it fulfills an important requirement for some of the graduate students, so we do have to have a midterm and a final. Uh, we'll probably have homework roughly uh, every other week, although homework zero <laughs> is due next week. Uh, homeworks will be due on Wednesday nights at midnight, roughly. Um, other uh, funny policies we have include uh, we will drop uh, the lowest 20% of your homework scores, so we just at the end, whatever was the lowest 20% of your scores, I'll drop that, so that sort of, uh, uh, you know, lessens, eases the uh, pressure a little bit. Um, you can submit homework up to one week late uh, for up to 65% of the credit, uh, but we also will do this funny thing where we'll try to put out solutions uh, right after uh, you submit your homework for the normal deadline so you can actually look at the answers and change your answers and kind of correct yourself in time for the late deadline as well uh, if you want it. Uh, I will have office hours after every class in my office, which is somewhere over there. And um, our TA, uh, we like to go by JD. And we'll probably have his on Wednesday since homework is due that day. We figure that's what you would guys want the most. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, next class, uh, we'll have lots of time to talk about this a little bit in more detail. So take a look. Um, I think these are probably the things you guys are most interested in. Okay. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kent. Hey. Uh what are, uh, what are the goals of the course? Always an important question. I guess, you know, step one is just, you know, get better at basic probabilistic ideas, techniques, and familiarize with yourself with these things, get proficient at doing some basic uh, stuff. Okay, that kind of goes without saying. Um, but I think one thing really great about this topic, randomized algorithm, is that it just touches on so many different things in computer science. Like, take any subfield you want, and like a major, major result, a key idea was to introduce randomization where it hadn't been used uh, before. Which means I can use this course uh, to also expose you to really a broad class of different problems in different areas. Okay, so that's, that's one of the goals. Uh, and so you can see randomized ideas come up from a lot of different perspectives used in a lot of different ways. Okay. So one, one goal is beyond, you know, basically getting good at randomized algorithms is because of exposure to different parts of computer science. And the other great part is, again, all these different parts will have in common is these randomized aspects, which means that not only will you get to see lots of different things, but you also get to understand why kind of all these big ideas in different areas have stuff in common uh, as well. And it'll also help unify this sort of broad field of computer science, at least from this 
perspective of randomization. Okay, so we'll be co covering a lot of topics, a lot of different topics, hopping around, sort of building an incremental, you know, technical, from a technical perspective. Um, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. So I've already um, planned out sort of a schedule uh, that you'll find on the website, roughly similar to what I taught a couple years ago. Um, swapping out some lectures here and there. Okay. Um, and anyway, so you'll you'll see it and you'll get some sense. Okay. All right. So I think that's it. Okay. Any quick questions before I actually start teaching? Uh, one last thing uh, to note based on some emails, if you're trying to register and you haven't gotten in yet, uh, just wait. I'm sure spots will open up. Um, in the meantime, you can still attend a lecture. You can still sign up for Gradescope. You can still do everything. And if, if we actually can't get spots to fill up, then we'll, we'll figure out something with the administrators. Okay, on, on to the party. All right, well, what will we cover today? I know some, some people uh, have taken other classes before, just so overlap uh, a little bit, but I'm sure uh, they have gladly forgotten it, most of it anyway. Okay, so today today we're just going to, you know, one basic goal is to get you introduce some basics of probability. Maybe you've seen some of these vocabulary terms uh, before, so maybe that would be more of a refresher. In that case, that's fine. Um, and... Uh, as a vehicle, I've chosen uh, three basic problems that you guys should have all seen before. One is reset, right? Uh, and I'll have some slides about it in a moment. Another is sorting, again, basic topic from undergraduate algorithms. And the third topic is uh, selection, okay? And actually, I'm just going to introduce the algorithm and try to get you guys excited because you'll analyze it yourself uh, in the homework. But it'll, be on some similar ideas from the other two applications. Okay. So, uh, okay. We have to go through a bunch of definitions here. It's a little bit dry. So what I'm going to do first is present the algorithms that we're going to analyze. Okay. Uh, and then we'll go through the definitions. We'll go back and analyze the algorithms themselves because the algorithms, uh, I think already have a very nice appealing qualities. They are going to be basically optimal for each of their respective problems, but they're also very clean and very simple as algorithms. You'll see they're extremely simple to code, uh, for example. Okay, so hopefully that'll give some concrete idea in your mind uh, to carry you through all the mathematical definitions we'll have to go through. And then we'll come back to the fun algorithms. Okay, so let's go through that. Okay, we'll start with Reset. Okay. So I think you guys should have seen this before. Uh, but you're given some Boolean formula. It was variables, Boolean variables x1 through xn that take true or false as values. Right? And we have these clauses like um, x1 or not x2 or x3. So if I had set x1 to be true or x2 to be false or x3 to be true, you would satisfy that first clause. And it says, okay, and you have to satisfy the next clause, and you have to satisfy the next clause. So, of course, I'm sure most of you have seen this. Now, uh, we're going to focus today on just three sat, which means three variables uh, per clause. It just keeps things a little bit cleaner. M will be the number of clauses. N will be the number of variables. Uh, in your undergraduate algorithms class, you might have remembered we were just obsessed with this problem. Uh, partly because it sort of completed this picture of MP completion, right? There's this idea that, oh, if you can solve SAT, then you can solve circuits. If you can solve circuits, you can solve any MP hard problem or any problem that can be verified in polynomial time because the verifier itself represents a polynomial time circuit. And, you know, you can use it and it's set to solve three SAT, so forth. And you have this wonderful equivalence as far as obtaining a polynomial running time goes, right? Uh, so 
you know, three sad has always has a special place in our hearts, even though on the flip side, it's also a very simple problem in terms of its definition. It's not that many moving parts. It's just ands and ors. Okay? So we know that, okay, we're never going to solve three sat. That's fine. So what might we do instead? Right? We might try to approximate this problem, roughly do the best we can. It's the right attitude to have. Okay? So rather than trying to satisfy all the clauses in your three sat formula, you can have a more constructive goal of just trying to satisfy as many as possible. Right? Now, actually satisfying exactly the maximum, or truly obtaining the maximum, is still going to be empty hard. Why? Because you have to try everything. Uh, not quite. I think it's some You want to the maximum? Sorry? You want to make the maximum? Uh, I think it's still a little off, but you guys are in the general mm -hmm. vicinity. Even if you know the maximum, it is still like a, um, and you, um, it, you can still like counting um, clauses in the, uh, in, of the five, which will still be a three set of that number. I'm thinking, because once you set up a maximum number of clauses, they'll either be all the clauses, which you know is satisfiable, but if the max is not, then you know it's not satisfiable. Uh, which is basically... Perfect. Okay, so that's, that's just the, just the most direct answer, which is that if you could figure out the max, then in particular you could figure out if they're all satisfiable, which means you could solve the original problem. Okay, so the max itself doesn't make the problem easier or more tractable or anything like that, but the nice thing is it's made it quantitative, so we can bring up the question of approximation. Can you satisfy half the clauses in a formula? Okay, that's the key thing. Once you make it quantitative, okay, now we have something to work with. Um, so in particular, we'll talk about, say, an alpha approximation, a 50% approximation, a two-thirds approximation. It's saying, okay, there's some opt, right? There's a best possible out there. We might not even know it, actually. If we could know it, too strong. But maybe we can still guarantee that we always get at least two-thirds times whatever is the true maximum. And that's sort of what people do in approximation algorithms, which is really how we approach all these very useful NP-hard problems that we can't solve exactly. So a very practical kind of thing to do. Okay. All right. So three sat. But we're doing max three sat. I want to satisfy as many clauses as possible, three variables per clause. Okay? This problem is not necessarily MP hard. Right? Trying to satisfy 50% as much as off doesn't tell you if the formula is satisfiable or not. Okay. Anyone want to suggest, just for fun, some ideas? Break this thing into parts which are not related. Okay, you can try to break the formula into parts that are not related. That's asking for a lot. I mean, what if they're related? All over the place, right? I mean, we're dealing with combinatorial objects. One combination, I mean, yeah. Yeah. A side of random variable. Okay. All right, so that's the silliest answer then. Here, Okay, usually people propose like, okay, let's look at x1 and see if it appears as x1 or not x1 more, right? And okay, I'll choose x1 equal to true, okay. But you can imagine exploring lots of ideas like that, okay? Or you can go straight to the next slide. <laughs> okay, so here then would be um, the algorithm we're going to analyze, okay? It's quite uh, silly. For every variable xi, I'll set it to be true. I'm going to flip a coin. Okay, I'll set it to be true with probability one half. Okay, and I'll set it to be false with probability one half. Right? So, uh, uh, this is an algorithm. It's not a very sophisticated algorithm. It takes n coin tosses. I guess it's a very fast algorithm. That's great. 
that algorithm with this nonsense. Um, and it doesn't even look at the formula. Right? It really has almost nothing to do with the input beyond maybe understanding how many variables there are. So here's what we're going to prove. Very slowly. So we're going to first prove that for 3 sap we're going to be able to get a 7 8 approximation by this silly algorithm. And it will be more fun, and those who have taken my class before have not seen this, is that we'll take this just coin something algorithm, and we'll turn it into a deterministic algorithm that gets the same approximation ratio. Okay, so the first algorithm was very random, right? We flipped a coin for everyone. We'll, we'll, we'll use that as inspiration and come up with one that's not random at all, but gets the same guarantee. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Okay, fine. So you get some approximation with this absurd algorithm. But here's what's even more surprising. Here's what's really amazing. There's a theorem called PCP theorem. PCP stands for probabilistically checkable proofs. It says that doing any better than 7 8th, and 7 8th, what is that? Point something, I forget. 7 8th plus 0 0.00001 approximation ratio, that's NP hard. 7 8th plus 0 0.00001 approximation ratio is also NP hard. So, in fact, what can actually prove that this is the best possible approximation ratio we can get unless p equal mp. And it's obtained by doing nothing but flipping coins. The one reason I want to mention this now, so PCP stands for probabilistically checkable proofs. And it has a lot to do with randomized algorithms and randomized thinking um, as well. And the goal, uh, by the end of the course, is to expose you to some of the ideas, to maybe prove parts of this theorem. So we won't be able to get seven A's plus epsilon, but we'll be able to probably prove some constant closer to one. Okay, all the way seven A's is a lot more work. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, amazing stuff out there. OK. All right, so that's, that's the three set. We'll analyze that uh, momentarily. Let me also introduce you to quicksort or reintroduce you. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. Okay. All right, sorting, as you guys know, you're given n comparable elements, like you're given a bunch of numbers. You want to put them in increasing order, of course. Uh, merge sort, as we uh, all learned, takes uh, n log n time for n numbers. Right? We divide them in half, we sort it, and then we kind of flip it together. Uh, there's also n log n lower bound uh, in the comparison model. You have to make at least n log n out comparisons to guarantee you're right. This is not so hard uh, to prove, but I won't I won't do it here. Okay, so n log n is is the right answer. Okay. All right. So, but you guys might remember merge sort, and it is a little bit intricate, right? You recurse, but then you kind of zip them together and you compare the two. And, okay. Question or comment? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, yes. Yeah. All right, so then here then is the, the, the algorithm we'll analyze. I have a picture for it in a moment. But you have a bunch of numbers in some random order, right? Or arbitrary order. We should be careful about the use of the word random, right? What we're going to do is we're going to pick one of these numbers uniformly at random. So I pick one of the numbers, and I make two piles. One in all the numbers that are smaller, one in all the numbers that are bigger, I'll recursively sort them. Then I have this is correct, that number I pick, this is correct, and I glue them together. Just concatenating. I don't have to zip them up to like merge sort. Okay, so because here then was was a diagram. That random number we pick, I guess it's sometimes called a pivot. Okay? But I guess we pick that one in blue. I divide it in two halves. Right? That just takes n comparisons, all very big or any smaller, very many elements. And it will be great. Okay. And what's great about this algorithm is it's very clean, it's very simple, assuming you have a random number generator. Okay. And so it's actually um, sometimes used in practice. So at least for a while, it was the default sorting algorithm in Unix, for example. Okay. 
So that was great performance. I think due in part because the code is so simple. It's not doing much extra work. Okay. So the first thing we're going to show is that this will take that ideal n log n time. An expectation is a fancy word, but that's a fancy word for on average. Okay. And the second thing we'll prove, which is a little bit stronger, is that not only does it take n log n time on average, but it almost always takes n log n time. Like, yeah, you'll get struck by lightning long before you notice it's taking longer than n log n. Okay. So that's that's pretty cool. Okay, and that will be the first example of what we see is, you know, what we kind of see that's kind of interesting is that we take random phenomena, by random you think that anything can happen, unstable, undeterministic, who knows, right? And but then we get these high probability guarantees. They're in fact very well behaved, they're very reliable, despite being seemingly random. We'll see that a lot. So this is supposed to be just the first example. All right. The last algorithm to try to get you guys excited is quick select. Maybe you've seen this too. Okay. So selection is a little bit like sorting, a little bit simpler. That's a problem. You're given n elements again in no particular order, but they're comparable. And I give you some index k, like n over 2 would be the medium. I say, oh, give me the, the k smallest element. It's called the rank K element. And the obvious approach, of course, is oh, they just store it and then figure out number K. I'll take N log N time. But you guys might have seen that you could do this amazing divide and conquer algorithm, sometimes called median opinions, and actually do it in linear time. Okay. This one was is quite complicated, both to code up uh, and analyze relatively. Okay, and in fact, actually, although it's linear time, I think in practice often you're better off just sorting and finding the kth element. <laughs> okay. But you wouldn't actually use this algorithm in practice. We're going to inst you would instead use the following simpler algorithm, which is very much similar to quick sort. So you want to find that on the median of the kth largest element. It's somewhere in the pile. You don't know where. So we just pick one arbitrary. Pick one randomly, not arbitrarily, we'll pick one randomly, uniformly at random, and we'll figure out its rank. Right? It might be too big, it might be too small. If it's too big, then we should recurse on all the elements that are smaller. If it's too small, I should recurse on all the elements that are bigger. And that's all the algorithm does. Right? So you take a pivot, you calculate the rank, you make comparisons to calculate the rank, and then you figure out which side to go into and you just keep it. This one's actually fast in practice. This one is better than sorting in practice, especially if, if quick sort is the fastest way to sort, and this is only doing like half of quick sort in each iteration, and of course, it's going to be faster. Okay, uh, so this, this one, uh, all right, that's the code, who cares? So uh, I think by the end of the class, you will have the tools to show that this takes linear time uh, and expectation, as you might imagine. Maybe something similar to what you do for quicksort could be extended uh, to this topic. All right. Okay. So those those were the appetizers. Um, uh, but the three problems I wanted to set up to to get us uh, going for the next conversation. This is where I have to define everything highlighted. In fact, I forgot to highlight the last one. Okay, so uh, what, what does this mean, events, probabilities, conditional probabilities, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but these are just kind of the basic uh, mathematical language we need to kind of uh, very concretely talk and discuss and correctly understand these algorithms. Okay. All right, so, all right, how would I introduce probability? Okay. So at some level, you guys have a strong sense of probability. You guys use probabilistic language all the time. You know what a coin flip is. You know what an average is and stuff like that. Okay? 
And at some level, I don't think there will be any surprises in the following definitions. But the only tricky part is actually to stick to the definition, stick to those baby rules. Uh, stay in this. Okay. Especially because probability, I know, there could be a lot of unintuitive things. Okay. So, uh, you flip a coin, and uh, you guess uh, it's or tails. Right? Of course. Uh, and at that point in time, you don't know uh, what the outcome will be. It's uncertain event. But if I said, you know, how often is it going to come up heads or something, you guys would all say something like, oh, half the time it'll come up heads, half the time it'll come up tails. That's a statement you're totally comfortable with. Right? Okay, so what, what does that mean? Right? How can it be half the time when there's only one coin? It's going to be heads or it's going to be tails. Right? But somehow you already understand that, oh, you can kind of imagine doing this experiment in parallel and you did a hundred times, so it'll be around 50-50. Right. So you already have a good intuitive sense for probability. So in probability theory, we're taking we have events. Something happens or doesn't happen. And they're sort of assigned these probabilities between zero and one. Every event has a probability. The coin coming up heads, that's an event. Probability of that event. 50%. Okay. For every event, there's the event of the event not happening, complementary event, and that will have, the probabilities will have to add up to 1. Okay. So if A happens, A bar cannot happen. If A bar happens, A must happen. Okay. Guessing you guys have seen this before. Okay. So, by the way, my, my, my approach on this kind of uh, these sort of technical definitions, just trying to get through it once, okay? I know half of you have seen it, or maybe more, most of you have seen it at least a little bit before. I still can't totally skip it. So I'm just going to try to get through it, and I think it's when we start using it and playing with it, that's when it'll start to really make more sense. Okay, so uh, first, if you're just already bored, I'm sorry. But also, if you haven't seen this much before, and it feels like a lot is coming fast, that's totally fine. It's totally reasonable. But we'll keep using the same definitions all semester long, and then your level of comfort will go up. Okay? So let's fly through it. Okay. So with two events, okay, uh, you know, you, we're going to start talking about combinations of events. So one combination is, oh, you have a joint event. I have event A, event B. Now, A and B both occurring represents a new event of its own. Okay. Uh, now, given A and B, you can kind of make four combinations, right? Oh, A and B occur. A occurs, B doesn't occur. A doesn't occur, B occurs. Neither A nor B occurs. Okay. And of those four combinations, exactly one will happen, right? Some kind of a diagram thingy. Uh, so all of these probabilities will add up to one. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, conditional probabilities. If I start from the statement where given two events, A and B, when A occurs, either B occurs or B doesn't occur. Right? Okay, fine. So that means that the probability of A occurring is going to be equal to, on one hand, both A and B occurring, plus probability of A occurring and B not occurring. Um, but if I divide everything, uh, okay, so now if I take this expression, I divide everything by probability of A, okay, this term becomes 1, and I sort of have these two fractional values adding up to 1. They sort of all also look like probabilities. Okay. So this is called the prob conditional probability, where B is conditional on A. So if you knew A had occurred within that universe, so to speak, what are the odds of B occurring? That's what probability of B given A represents. Uh, and they're always going to obey the usual B occurring or B not occurring 
add it back up to one. Okay? Kind of within that universe where A did occur. Okay? Now in general, knowing that A occurred will change the likelihood of B occurring. Okay? Unless they're completely but we'll get to that. So in general, probability of B given A you should expect to be different than probability of B, but it could be the same. Okay? So at a high level, two events are quote unquote independent if they have essentially nothing to do with each other. Okay? Whether or not one event occurred gives you no information about whether the other event occurs or will occur or is more likely to occur. So if you work out, and this is an exercise in the notes, if you work out the various definitions, all three of these are equivalent to each other, and they all imply that A and B are independent. Perhaps the most common one is that the probability of A and B occurring is equal to the probability of A times the probability. All right, I think I have an example. Not yet, though. Okay. All right. All right, so that's talking about intersections of events. We can also talk about, instead of the end, the or. Event A or event B occurs. That itself can be treated as an event. So we use whatever A or B as a kind of notation. Okay? Now, if I knew that A or B occurred, I now have three combinations. I could have that both A and B occurred, or only A occurred and B didn't or only B occurred in A did. Okay. So, whatever. So they all add up. Now, one thing nice, though, um, uh, is that upon rearranging, uh, you'll get that the probability of A plus the probability of B is equal to the probability of A or B plus the probability of A and B. So one way to sort of think of this is it's basically expressing a Venn diagram. Okay. So maybe here is, you can very much think of it as throwing darts. Oh, I shouldn't use green. Okay. Imagine throwing darts at that Venn diagram. And you can ask yourself, okay, what's the probability of it landing in A? What's the probability of landing in B? A or B? A and B? Right? And from that dark point of view, it's going to be kind of summing up the areas. Right? So just according to your Venn diagram logic, A plus B in terms of area is equal to A or B plus A intersection B because the intersection is getting counted twice. Right? Okay. But one thing very nice uh, that falls out of this is if I drop this non-negative term, all probabilities are non-negative. Okay, we are left with this sort of simpler inequality. The probability of A or B occurring is at most the probability of A plus the probability of B. Okay? This is sometimes called the union bound. Okay, and it might not seem very exciting. In fact. Perhaps many of, much of this has not seemed so exciting. But one thing very nice, well, we'll see. It'll come up a lot. It'll come up a lot. One thing very nice about these very simple inequalities is that we don't require any knowledge about A and B. And so what will happen is we'll be analyzing these kind of very complicated algorithms. There's a lot going on. There's all these different events. They're related to each other in weird ways. But we can still apply the union bound and... If it's strong enough, it's strong enough. It's often good enough. Okay. All right. So much for events. Okay. So sort of going beyond events, we also have random variables. Okay. So the standard example is a dice. And you can think of a dice as a random variable. That's one of the values 1 through 6. Each was equal probability, 1 over 6. Okay. So a random variable is just something that will take on some value with various different probabilities. 
Okay, so today I think we only need kind of finite discrete random variables where a random variable is one of 10 different values, one of n different values, whatever. Okay. But of course, in other situations, you might say, oh, this is a random real value between 0 and 1. Right? Stuff like that. So you can also have continuous random variables and so forth. Okay. So, okay. So a coin toss, uh, x can be heads or x can be tails, the probability of both is equal to one half. That's the usual example. Dice could be one of six values. Okay. Not too exciting. Okay. So much for one random variable at a time. Of course, we'll often have more than one random variable at a time. We'll often have like n random variables at a time, but let's start with two. Okay. And now you want to analyze, you know, the joint distribution of two dice or something, right? Very natural question to ask. Okay. So if you have two random variables, here we have x taking on k values and y taking on l different values. You can kind of imagine the tuple x comma y being a random variable in and of itself, where it, it kind of realizes pairs, right? One pair of consisting of one x value and one y value, right? Okay, so that means if a pair of random variables is a random variable, then all our usual logic applies. And as usual, we should caution that unless we knew a lot about x and y in general, the probability that x is equal to some value, y is equal to some value, is not equal to the probabilities taken apart. Right? Especially if x and y are related. Okay. When they are when that equality does hold for all possible values of x and y, then they're independent. In fact, you can look at this x equals xi event as an event and y equals yj as an event and go back to our definition of independent events and it's exact same. Okay. All right. Again, not too exciting of an example of a difference between independent and de dependent. If you flip two different coin top, two different coins, right, independent coins. So I have x and y, and they model different coins that are being tossed. And I want to look at, oh, what are the odds of heads, heads, or heads, tails, or tails, heads, or tails, tails, right? Um, each of those combinations are going to have a probability of one fourth. So you have one half this and one half that, and they have nothing to do with each other. But on the flip side, if x and y, of course, model the same coin, right? So in other words, you're flipping one coin, the output gets assigned to x and y. And of course, you'll get heads, heads half the time, tails, tails half the time, and never heads, tails, never tail heads, because they're just reflecting the same. <coughs> this example is obvious, but, but again, when it gets more complicated, it's not clear when things are dependent and independent or analyzing algorithm. So you have to be careful. Okay. Are we done? No. Okay. I think we're in the last leg, of, however, of the definitions. And this is about averages. Right? So I think we all know what an average is, what a batting average is, what an average midterm score is, and so on and so forth. Right? Okay. So how do I, how do, what is the official definition uh, of the expected value? Okay, so I have some random variable x. I'm saying what is the expected value of x? We write e of x in that way. So what we do is we sum over kind of all the possible values it can take. The probability of being equal to that value times that value. I think this will agree with your definition of average that you had in mind. Okay, that's fine. Now there's one, well, there's a lot of really nice things about average, and actually most of our discussions today will be about focusing on the average, and it's only because we focus on the average that we'll be able to say anything at all. Okay. The most useful thing you'll learn in this class, maybe, is what's called linearity of expectation. And maybe you already learned it. But it's saying that if I had two random variables, x plus y, And I wanted to know the average 
of x plus y. And in fact, it's going to be equal to the expected value of x, the average of x, plus the average of y. So the expected sum is equal to the sum of expectations. Okay. This is not so hard to prove. I've left it as an exercise in the notes, but you just you know you plug in this definition and you work through it. You interchange one sum. It's not a big deal. Okay. Well, what so uh, this seems very unexciting. Just something up to your things. So what's spectacular about this identity? So so first of all, we're often interested in averages. So it's, it's, it's already coming up, but. You know, before we talked about, oh, is the probability of A and B equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, maybe, maybe not, depending on whether it's independent or dependent, right? We don't have these nice things of splitting things apart normally, right? But when it comes to averages, and I want to understand this kind of combined, complicated phenomenon, it doesn't have to be two variables, it could be n variables, right? You could do two, you could do n, right? So this represents some complicated phenomenon with lots of things going on. Lots of random variables being added together, and they're all jointly independent in the slope rate. Right? But it's saying that when I want to analyze it, I can analyze each component separately. If I can analyze x by itself, not worrying about y, and I can analyze y by itself, not worrying about x, then I understand x plus y. And it's only because something's going on with averages, that sort of simplifies things. Like I can actually ignore a lot of details about how x and y are related. So this is extremely important. OK, a few more definitions. We're almost done. This is just stuff that's going to come up. All right, so we talked a little bit about conditional events before. Oh, if I know that A is going to happen, then how does that change the probability of B? You can do the same thing with averages. If I have some event A and I'm looking at some random variable x, I say, oh, if A happened, now what's the average? What's the uh, expected value of something knowing that something else has occurred? And this is basically the exact same definition, except now it's conditional on the event. Okay. All right. What else is there to say? Uh, OK, well, we may often take expectations over multiple random variables. I guess that was partly implicit already in linearity of expectation. A little out of order, that's OK. OK, so but let me quickly do identity. So let's say I have two random variables, x and y, and I want to evaluate some function f of x and y. Who knows what that is? It doesn't matter. Now, by definition, if I'm just kind of going, applying the definition of expected value to the joint random variable of x and y, I'll be summing over all the little x, little y's that it can take. The value of f of x and y, f of x, y, times the probability of this joint thing, right? Okay. And now we're going to do a little bit of uh, interchange kind of sums. So we can write this using our conditional expectations or probabilities. Okay. Conditional on x equal to x times the probability that x equals x. Okay. So the probability of x being equal to x and y being equal to y, we can break that down as Okay, first one the odds that x is equal to x. Find out that that happens, right? Now, given that x is equal to x, what's the probability that y is equal to y? Right, so that's the same kind of thing. Okay, which can then, I can take my sum, which is kind of looping over all the x's and y's, and break it into two sums. So one is first looping over x, and then we'll loop over y on the inside. Okay. So I'm going to sum over x, and inside I'll sum over y, f of x, y, 
the probability of y, I'm running out of space, forgive me, I have all the space on the left, anyway. Okay, so I'm taking sort of a nested loop over top of it, throw it out explicitly. Okay. But one thing kind of nice is that the inside is saying, okay, what is expected value over y? The only randomness is over y for fixed x. I'm missing the one bracket. Okay, so the nice thing about this bottom expression is that what I'm saying is that this expectation over x and y can be seen sort of iteratively as saying, okay, let's first take some randomness over x, okay, the expected value over x, and then inside it you have an experiment that is given the value of x, what is the expected value of x, y, or now only y is left. Okay. That's going to come up. Okay. Almost done. All right, so a reason I, I had that last line was to introduce this, this law of iterative expectation system, which is sort of a weird thing. Okay. Suppose I have some random variable x, and I just want to know expected value of x. But it could be that for some weird contextual reason that I could always, there's some other random variable y where I would understand the expected value of x given y better. Okay, I mean, it'll, it'll come up for a quick sort. But here's the example I found on the internet. All right, x, on one, I, at some level, I want to know if it's going to rain tomorrow. Okay? And I have a hand of public information. I know the odds of it raining today. It's not raining today. And but I also know conditional on it raining today, what are the odds of it raining tomorrow? And I know conditional on it not raining today, the odds of it raining tomorrow. So maybe I knew that if it was going to rain today, then it was going to rain tomorrow, it was a 50% chance. Whereas if it didn't rain today, it's going to rain tomorrow, it's 25% chance or something. And I know it's going to rain, it's 50% chance today. Right? So, and I just want to know the odds it's going to rain tomorrow. The law of iterative expectations is saying that actually we have all the information we need. Okay? Because I can evaluate expected value of x given y. Okay. It'll be more interesting when it comes up in the analysis, but I wanted to put it out there. All right. Second most interesting, so the second most inter important thing after linear expectation that will come up today is what's called Markov's inequality. Okay. It only holds for a non-negative random variable x. Okay. So here's maybe uh, a fact. Okay, so let's look at the uh, scores on the midterm. Okay, that's non-negative. You can't do worse than zero. Right? Uh, consider the following statement. At most half the class can get at least twice the class average, no matter how little the average. So even if the average is only 20% or something, right, it's saying at most half the class can get over 40%. Is that obvious? Why? In that example, why, why must that be true? Yeah. Because someone can do worse than zero. Yeah, somebody can't do worse than zero. That's true. Well, you go further. Oh, well, if, if you wanted to have in, like, scores balance the average, like, if you if you have to balance out... Um, yeah, it doesn't add up in some sense. If more than half the class got at least 40%, this is an abysmal example, if more than half the class got at least 40%, the average would have to be at least 20% from those students alone, even if everyone else got zero, right? So. Okay, so this is not... Uh, Okay, so uh, the proof is more or less uh, the same uh, as that argument, but here's maybe one way to do it. So if I look at the expected value of x, okay. 
I can look at, uh, I can break it up with some conditional events. So we can do the expected value of this random variable given that x is at least alpha times the probability that x is at least alpha, right? So in some universe, the random variable is at least alpha. What is the expected value within this universe? Okay. Or we go into the other universe where it's less than alpha with some probability. Okay. All right, so this term is, of course, at least zero no matter what, since x is always non-negative. And this term well, in particular, this part, okay, it says x given x is at least alpha. So I know x is at least alpha. Okay. All right. So we get alpha times the probability that x is at least alpha, which is just rearranging the desired inequality. Okay. All right, fine. Non-negative random variable can't be that much greater than the average. That's what it's saying. That too often. Right? Otherwise, something breaks. Now, I think the other... Um, okay, so why is, this, why is this useful? We will often study average behavior. And that will be the first thing we do, right? Oh, this algorithm takes this much time on average. Oh, I get this approximation on average. Something happens on average. But it will also be useful to know how often you're close to the average. And if you're just never close to the average anyway, then who cares? So this is maybe the first step, or the first tool we have, saying, oh, okay, a non-negative random variable x can't be too much bigger than its average all the time. Otherwise, the average would have to be bigger. And actually, it's the starting point. Uh, it's, it's the technical starting point of much stronger concentration inequalities, so to speak, concentration around the average. It's a general phenomenon, which we'll talk about in future classes. Okay. Oh, thank God. Okay. We're done. We're done with the driest part. We can go back to algorithms. And I'll remind you of all the things you've already forgotten. Okay? All right. All right. So let's do three set. I guess we have 20 minutes. Okay, so... You guys remember this reset setup? We have a formula, three variables per clause. It's important, blah, blah, blah. We're going to look at an algorithm that sets every random, every variable randomly to true or false. Apparently, it's quite good. Okay. We're first going to show that we get a seven eight approximation. And then we'll show how to make it deterministic. And hopefully, we'll do it fast. OK. All right, so. I thought we'd start small. Okay. What if the formula only had one clause? Okay. What is the expected number of clauses that'll be satisfied if I randomly flip coins? In particular, what are the odds of satisfying that clause? Uh, okay, so you're saying that the the probability of satisfying it, I heard one eighth. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Sorry? Uh, Half. Seven eighths. Seven eighths. Okay, any others? All right, why one eighth? Um, there are three. Uh, Satisfy the clause, you have to choose like uh, x1 should be uh, 1, x2 should be 1, and x3 should be uh, 0. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. They are all satisfied. Okay. Why 1 half? Whatever function is satisfied, that should be the same reason why it should be equally unsatisfied. Well, if I had set x1 to be true, and x2 to be false, and even ignore x3, it'll be satisfied, right? And if I flip it, so x1 is false and x2 is true or whatever, it'll still be satisfied. 
Okay, why 70? Uh, it's 1 minus, I think it's at, at the close, and it's 5, the close, and it's 6, 5, the only one condition. Okay, there's only one way to get it wrong. Yeah. I have to get x1 to be false, and x2 to be false, and x3 to be true. So out of uh, eight combinations, there's only one way to get wrong. I mean, there's seven ways to get right. Okay, seven, eight. So it turns out that it's much easier to realize the probability that not E1 is equal to one eighth, in which case the probability of E1 is equal to seven eighth. Okay. All right. What if I had two clauses, but they had no variables in common? Or maybe to simplify our discussion a little bit, what is the probability of E1 and E2? So what are the probabilities of satisfying both clauses simultaneously? Okay. Okay, so in this case, uh, they have nothing in common, so the coin flips for one have nothing to do with the other. Okay. So we're actually able to break this apart as probability of E1 times the probability of E2. And then this is clearly much easier, right? Because after uh, a few guesses, we know how to do one clause. Okay. All right. But now what happens if I put one common variable in the middle? All right. So I have X1, X2, and X3 is appearing in both clauses now. What are the odds that they're both true? Um. I'll note this isn't the most complicated formula in the world. One minus two to the fifth. One minus one over two to the fifth? Yeah. Okay, why? Well, because, again, thinking of... I think I see this. I was thinking of trying to see, using the same idea as the one thought, and see how can we get it wrong. And the, the two of the fifth thing because to get it wrong, we can set five variables wrong. Yeah, okay. So, so at some level, there's actually five variables involved. Um, but that would be the... Oh, but that would be to get them all wrong. Yeah. Okay, so that's... That would be the... So you're, 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 you figured out the probability of getting at least one right. Yes. Okay. How about the probability of getting both right? Yeah. You had your hand up briefly? Uh, I was just going to say one half, which is probability x3 is true, plus the probability that but x3 is false, which is 6, 5, which is okay. uh, equals 3. So we can do some like conditional stuff. e1, e2, given that x3 is equal to true, okay, times the probability x3 equals to true, so I'll just write 1 half, that represents the probability of x3 equal to true, plus the probability of both of them, given x3 is equal to false times one half, that's the odds that x3 is equal to false. Okay, great. So what we've done, we've conditioned on the one thing they have in common, and then what remains can be split apart. Right? Okay, so if x3 is equal to true, then they're definitely both occurring. So that's a one. And now, if x3 is equal to false, what are the odds of them both being satisfied? Three, four, four squared. It's like three, four squared or something. And you add it up. Okay. All right. So, okay, that's just one case. Besides E1 and E2, you also want to look at E1 and not E2, and E2 and not E1, and I guess that's quite symmetric, and not E1, not E2. But look how much more complicated it got was one variable in common, right? Okay, now what happens if I put uh, three causes with some common variables, right? There's no point. It'll take us forever, right? let alone m clauses, right? We're, we're in general trying to analyze huge formulas. We're not even interested in one or two or three clauses. 
It's not going to be hard to solve the formula of this big plot. And, and there, I mean, it's just hopeless. I mean, even with a computer to map out all the cases, it's just exploding combinatorial. So that's the point. Now the general question then, and this comes up all the time, at some level it's what the class is about. How do we analyze some kind of randomized mechanism? What is a combinatorial explosion of possibility, right? This is way more complicated than some like dice rolling exercise. Yeah. I'm going to go to use the linear field. Yeah, okay, great. Why do I need to teach? Okay. All right, so the big idea then is that we only want the average. And that sort of simplifies things a lot. You don't really have to know how everything's related, not necessarily, to understand the average. Certainly the average doesn't tell you much about how the clauses are related. So then you don't have to know much about how the clauses are related to understand the average. So, all right, here come some of those definitions we labored through. I'm setting up a random variable, yi is equal to 1 if the i clause is satisfied and 0 if not. Okay. All right. What is the expected value of a single yi? This is the one that we knew how to solve. Uh, 1 minus 1 over 2 to the power of how many variables? 3 sat, so 7 eighth. Okay, 7 eighth. All right. Okay, now here comes the important part. All right, I want to know the expected number of clauses that are satisfied. That is the expected sum. I don't know how to do, analyze this sum. We just kind of went through that exercise trying to analyze things jointly with a penny. So what do I do here? Seven and by seven. What? Split them. Huh? Let's split them. Let's split them. Uh, using, what's the buzzword? Linear of expectation, okay. So, linear of expectation, the fact that I'm only worrying about average, I can now look at the sum of the individual averages. And one of these is quite easy to analyze. So we get 7 over 8 times that. That should be in a numerator. So it's actually quite easy to analyze. And nothing to do with all the complicated ways the clauses are related to. Awesome. Okay, fine. That's the random algorithm. You get seven A's. In hindsight, it's quite easy. You need linear of expectation or else you're screwed. All right, how do I make this a deterministic algorithm? Okay. All right, so. Uh, okay, so the next step now is to take that completely the most random chaotic algorithm we could think of, which apparently is quite good, but make it completely deterministic. Where do I start? Okay, maybe one step place to start is trying to figure out how to choose x1. Let's choose x1 to be true, I'm going to choose x1 to be false. At some level, I know that random choice is pretty good. Random choice will lead me to 7. But how do I know which one? All right, so I'm now using z as a variable to represent the sum for ease of notation. Okay. And let's just do a little bit of conditional expectations. Okay. I know the expected value of z is the expected value of z given x1 turns out to be true times the probability that x1 is equal to true. Right? plus the expected value of z given x1 is equal to false times one half, right? So it's the average of these two expected values. But what does that tell us? So if this was a really small value, and this was a really small value, then their average must be really small. But this is pretty good, right? This is 7, 8, and M. So one of these two choices must get you at least 7, 8, and M. 
So either x1 equal to true or x1 equal to false, if you had like fixed that and then flipped everything else, you would get 7, 8, m on average. Okay. okay. So one of these choices is good. Okay. Just by kind of working through what average means. Okay. So next question then is how do we figure out which one? How can I figure out whether setting true or setting false is the one that will give me the average? Yeah? Just the number of clothes that x1 appears as positive and the number of clothes. Okay, so one idea is, okay, setting x1 to be true will immediately satisfy some clauses. I can count that up. The other one is to say, oh, it will immediately not satisfy some clauses. I can count that up. But if you follow that logic to the end, we should have originally done the algorithm where I just set x1 to be whatever satisfies the most. That greedy algorithm we know won't work. That's not actually how we're going to figure out the choice. Yeah. So set the whole thing randomly and then based on the number of flip everything. Oh, we could try simulating it. I'll set x1 to be true, do a bunch of simulations, and hope to get some sense of the average, maybe. Right? I could try to simulate to figure out this conditional expectation. So we can actually do it more directly, right? Let's see what's behind this box. Okay. We can actually use linearity of expectation yet again. So here I'm just looking at the expected value of z given x1 equal to true. Yeah, what are the expected numbers satisfy if I set x1 to be true? Ah, this again breaks down into the sum of uh, what are the odds of satisfying clause 1 if I set x1 to be true? Maybe that's deterministically 1 if x1 is in it. Maybe it doesn't change if x1's not in it at all. Maybe the odds went down a little bit if x1 appeared to that and x1 not. But you can calculate all these. You don't have to simulate them. This is just going to be some, oh, one half times one half kind of thing. Right? It'll be 7, 8, or it'll be 3, 4. Or it'll be 1. So you can actually evaluate this thing explicitly. And you can do the same thing for x1 equal to false. So you can compute expected value of z given x1 equal to true or x1 equal to false and figure out which one is better. And just be working through the definition of average. And now you might imagine, okay, now we fix x1 to be true and I just keep going. Right? So that's what we'll do. Nothing special. So maybe uh, after 10 steps, I've already figured out the first 10 steps so that my expected value after fixing the first 10 variables is still pretty good. I want to figure out x11, right? And we can do the same one more condition, conditioning on one more variable, right? So if I'm looking at the xk plus 1, oh, sorry. You know, we have the same thing where either setting xk plus 1 to be true or setting xk plus 1 to be false, one of these must be good. Okay. So once you figure out the first variable, then you figure out the second variable, then you figure out the third one, then you figure out the first, fourth, by just extending your conditioning until you figure out all of them. So this is sometimes called the method of conditional expectations or something. The same way to de-randomize. Okay. All right. Let's see what's. Um... Okay. So I think what will happen then is we'll be able to do the average running time of quicksort, but maybe not the high probability bound. I'll find a way to see that. In. Okay. All right. Okay. So so much for SAT. We had a randomized seven eighths algorithm. We used some conditional expectations. We made it deterministic. Okay. Let's do um, a quick sort, take an n log n time expectation. Okay. All right. All right. So again, quick sort, just to remind us, lots of um, unsorted numbers. I pick one of them uniformly at random. I make two piles. Sorry. Okay. Simple enough. How do I analyze quick sort? Right. It's sort of like a divide and conquer algorithm, isn't it? I pick a pivot and I split it into two. It is sort of dividing and conquering. 
Right? So if I wanted to write a recurrence, I might write, uh, okay, I pick some rank k element, uniformly at random, out of the n, and I'll have one subproblem of size k minus 1 elements on one side, plus another subproblem of n minus k elements on the other, plus linear time to assemble these elements. Right? Okay. Uh, but this uh, is a little bit tough to analyze. So, okay. Okay, so ideally, what, what would be the best pivot? The medium. The medium would be great. So if I kind of pick a pivot in the middle, right, then we would get sort of this more short style 2 Tn over 2 and okay, that's that mod, and we already know that. Right? But of course, you might not. The worst case is I pick out the smallest element. And then I just have n minus 1 unsorted elements. Great. Then I pick the worst one, the worst one, the worst one, the worst one again. Okay. You get n squared, right? So in the worst case, you know, you basically just end up with Tn minus 1 plus On. That's no good. N, N. Okay. So, what we're facing then, ideally we'd like to get n log n, but certainly in the worst case, it's n squared. But this is not the kind of worst case running time we're interested in. I mean, that's not the sense of worst case I'm interested in, right? Computer science, we're interested in worst case over inputs, right? The algorithm's random. So we're interested in random, or kind of expected running time in the worst case over inputs. That's the part that's out of our, kind of completely out of our control. That's the adversarial part, right? So, okay. And uh, fine. And the other thing I want to mention is just, uh, we don't have too much time to think too much about it, but it gets a little bit nasty if you do. You know, what happens if you pick a really good pivot at the beginning, and then bad pivots afterwards, and you compare that to, oh, picking a bad pivot first, and then good pivots after that or something. Oh, don't they require different analysis, right? What happens to all these kind of interchanging things, right? That's very common when we analyze randomized algorithms, okay? But then, of course, our saving grace is going to be the fact that we're only interested in the average running time. We don't necessarily have to map out all these different scenarios. Okay. One minute left. I'll probably be a little late. Okay. So, here's how we're going to set it up. We're only going to count the number of comparisons between elements, right? Because the number of total comparisons is roughly the running time. And we're just going to make a random variable uh, to indicate... Uh, uh, if a pair got compared or not. Okay, so xij is equal to 1 if the i's largest smallest element is compared to the j smallest, otherwise equal to 0. Okay, so the sum of xij is a total number of comparisons, that's our running time. Okay. Alright, so here then is your guys' one chance to participate before class is over. If I look at the expected sum, that's the expected running time, how am I going to break this apart? All right, linear expectation. Okay. And now all I have to do is worry about one of these terms. Okay. That's so much easier than understanding a complicated algorithm kind of more organically. All right, so if I fix a particular i and j now, again, it's only one, they get compared. So I want to understand the probability that they're compared. Right? So we have sort of the i element here and the j element there, and what are the odds that they get compared to each other? Now, over the course of the algorithm, right, they're kind of appearing in all these subproblems, 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 and then either one of them gets picked as a pivot, and then it gets compared. Or someone in the middle gets picked as a pivot, they get split apart and they'll never be compared. Okay. So, xij is equal to 1 if and only if the i or j-th element is selected before anyone in between as a pivot. Now, every round is completely fair. We're always picking a uniformly random pivot. So, no one's getting preferential treatment. Right? So, out of those j minus i plus 1, hopefully that's correct elements in that string, 
They all have an equal chance of coming first. So this will be 2 over j minus i plus 1. That's the expected value of one of these, which makes some sense if they are very close to each other, like j is equal i is equal to j plus 1, that odds is like 1, the number gets put apart. If they're really far apart, the probability is more like 2 over n, they're unlikely to be OK. Let's finish. OK. Now all that's left is just doing some calculations, right? So we already have our linear of expectation, and that breaks out into this sum of 2 over j minus i plus 1. Okay. All right, so this is at most two times, you know, if you look at it, it's like 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. So if you fix i and then j just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the denominator keeps going up by 1, right? All the way up to like, uh, in the worst case, n. Okay? I'm sure you guys have seen the summation before. What does this all sum up to? What's the fancy name for it? Actually, I don't care for names. What does this sum for? <laughs> 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. You guys know this? Series. Harmonic series. So it comes up to log n. Times some constant. Actually, it's really log n plus 1 or something. Okay? So you get the n log n like you wanted. Okay? By the way, don't ever forget this. If you want to sum up this series, right, this looks a lot like the integral from, say, 1 to n plus 1. It's uh, of 1 over x, right? And you're used, you know how to integrate 1 over x, that's log x, okay? All right, um, fine. We didn't do the high probability bound, that's fine. You don't need it for homework anyway. Um, uh, but that's the expected running time of quicksort. It's a good place to stop. Okay. So I'll have office hours after every class, including today. Uh, so please come by if you have questions. Thanks.